Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Mark the Liberty, and joining me today is... Corey Shallow Real Knockreiner. Shallow Real. Opposite of a deep fake. Ah! <laughs> but shallow. Okay. And that's... <laughs> I don't know. It's the first thing that came to my head. It's been a long day at Black Hat. <laughs> well done. As Corey just mentioned, we just finished up day two at Black Hat just like an hour and a half ago. So today we're coming back with you with another short recap of just our two favorite talks from today um, and some takeaways for you to take back on what they mean for our industry. And I guess uh, without any further ado, let's, I said hack our way in last time, breach our way in. Yeah, there you time. go. Yeah, that sounds great. It's like a whale out of the water. <laughs> So let's start today with a quick recap of today's uh, initial keynote. Which they was, do it, Black Hat. Yeah. I think one of your favorite. Uh, I, I maybe like him. favorite, but someone that at least you seem to talk about a lot. So I imagine someone Moxley, you respect. Moxley, Marlin Spike, yeah. yeah. Uh, encrypt, cryptography, SSL genius, old school hacker, I think, from even Dark Tangents age. Some of the examples he used are pop pop core examples, so I like that. And more recently, the founder of Signal, the secure messaging app, which started is what was it called? Red Redbox something Red or phone, other? I think. Red phone, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so the keynote to, uh, this morning to kick things off started with like Moxie going up on stage and giving this long um, discussion about like basically how we should improve engineering. Was my takeaway from it? and make sure engineering is more aligned and less, uh, I mean, we'll get into it in a second, but then he uh, went into just a little fireside chat with uh, uh, Jeff Moss, the dark tangent, about a few takeaways from that too. But I wanted to focus on his like initial discussion because there were some really interesting bits from it. I actually, I unfortunately missed the first five, 10 minutes of it yeah. for the uh, AI webinar, which is available on the WatchGuard webinars download page on demand right now, if you want to learn how to make an AI security policy for your company. Uh, but uh, when I came in, it was super interesting. Um, so maybe you can fill in before me if I'm missing anything key from it. But he was talking about how in the world of just engineering right now, um, we're going through a phase where we're starting to um, really focus on abstraction layers for components that we're using. And there's two different ways of handling abstraction layers. Think of it as like a you know, a library that handles some piece of code so you don't have to go write that. I think one of the examples he's ga he gave was um, logging for a, an application. Like you could go write logging components or you could go get a logging library um, and let that take care of it for you. And there's kind of benefits and trade-offs from using these abstraction layers depending on how you use them. If you're still like very uh, engineering minded, you might use it as a way just to speed up your code while still understanding fundamentally what's going on under the hood. But more often than not, people are treating them as just black boxes where they know it does something, they know how to set it up, but they don't like fundamentally understand how they work. And that's causing some issues. And I think it started even with Dark Tangent talking about the complexity of, of software in the cloud now. All these mechanism software different clouds different platforms that interact with each other but are these abstraction layers and i, I think marlin's main takeaway is while like you said there's benefits to abstraction layers I meaning at a high level it's rather than reinvent the wheel every time we want to pop up in a windows dialog box we don't have to do that but he was trying to show the the actual innovation that someone that actually digs deeper that, that reads the books, that reads all the details about a technology, suddenly they know so much about the deeper stuff that they can start to do magic. And one of the examples he started, which might've been before you got there, was he was showing animations from what had to be the 1980s uh, when enhanced graphics, EGA, I don't know if you even know what an EGA card is, but when no, I started VGA, VGA is the better one. Okay. So when I was a kid, you know, graphics were black and white or green and white, uh, green and black or amber and black. Then they had CGA, which was color graphics adapter, which did four colors. Ooh. EGA bumped that up to 16 and VGA was 256, if I remember correctly. Dang, look at all those colors. Oh, yeah. But one of the things you couldn't really do in the traditional way you could do now is, is 
animation with lots of rich colors and motion. And he showed how understanding how EGA was working and, and really on a bit by bit level where you would have some of those 16 colors mixed in a different way to make a pattern that from far away looks a certain way. We're doing a simple thing like a bit flip rather than trying to change all these pixels to create an animation, you could do a bit flip that would just change one of the colors to something else. It would have a big effect. Long story short, if you didn't know the underlying technology of how EGA worked, you couldn't figure out this cool way to create animations that were pretty, they looked decent nowadays for something that back then, 16 colors is not a lot to work with. And it was really his argument for if you don't understand the deeper systems, you can't get to like the optimization or the neat tricks or the, the better stuff. Yes, 90% of the time you'll be working in those abstraction layers, but understanding that deep stuff is important. He gave a more modern example too after I arrived on the scene um, about video game development. Where in the world of game development, uh, now there's all these different game engines that you can use to make really anyone be able to develop a video game. Like some of them, like RPG makers, one I'm aware of, where you don't even need any coding expertise at all. It's basically all plug and play. Even Unreal and Unity nowadays is pulling boxes around to do animation. Yeah, yeah. It can definitely help out a ton. So you don't need to know like fundamentals about like C development in order to create a game these days. And what that's meant is he showed this chart of the volume of games being released on Steam, which Steam is like the repository for video games, which are all of you are know nerds know that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, the, the volume of games being released on Steam has like skyrocketed over the last decade because of tools like video game engines making it easy for anyone to get in. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're releasing quality games because he looked on the same chart um, added a dot graph showing like the volume of critically acc acclaimed games, basically ones that get like really good reviews as high quality video games. And that's been steady at best if or not dropping. even dropping in some cases too. Yeah. So just because it's these abstraction layers are making things easier, doesn't mean they're necessarily making things better. And, yeah, and he talked about how engineering organizations are starting to do same thing where they're siloing teams into like modules of I don't know, you do cloud, you do network layer, you do whatever, but those silos end up being abstraction layers where the teams may not be getting as much communication to each other where they can really, when you start to learn all those technologies, you can learn neat ways to mesh it. So it, it really started where he said that right now the vision in engineering has been separated and it seems because of that velocity is down and there doesn't seem to be a ton of visionary engineering or game making or whatever where he really believes to to bring vision and engineering together you have to go into those abstraction layers but then i mean maybe you can talk about how the point of this was security though we're the ones in order to find vulnerabilities you know abstraction layers are where you go. That's where all the meat of the complexity and the interactions happen that you can tend to take advantage of. So yeah, that's where it really hit close to home. And clearly the point of this whole discussion was like security professionals and specifically like application security engineers, the ones that are trying to find issues in code, like you said, they have to understand on a fundamental level, they have to think differently yeah. and break through that abstraction layer, understand exactly what's going Lower on level, sometimes even more than the person that actually wrote it. Yeah. Uh, in order to find and resolve these issues uh, in these applications. Were it's strangely inspiring, too, because he essentially said we have inherited the world because seeing that deeper into those ap application or abstraction levels is, is magic. Like if you only know that if I put these inputs into this abstraction layer, I get these outputs and you never go deeper, you won't find all the magic and interesting things you can do if you understand how the subsystems work. So it was actually like cool. the, the takeaway from it for me was I'm glad I went into cybersecurity security and not software engineering yeah. <laughs> uh, because we definitely have the cooler job and the more interesting it one. feels that way yeah. although and i say this is someone that does not code much at all anymore but i did at one point i actually think to really be good at cybersecurity, you do need to understand software engineering and that's something you're diving into yeah. yourself absolutely so the yeah. the keynote was pretty cool they had a little fireside chat that i mean it was interesting there were yeah. some interesting takeaways about how like software development is fundamentally expensive because you have to maintain what you put out there yeah versus the analogy used was like a recording an album as a musician 
once you're done recording, you make a movie and you have a thing. Exactly. You don't have to keep it. Everything around the movie is not changing, so you have to update it over Unless and you're over. George Lucas. That's um, a good point. <laughs> That's an excellent point. The metaphor breaks down. Yeah, but for normal humans and filmographers and musicians, like once you put out your creative work, you're done. Versus with software, you have to maintain it for or 10, it 20 years. Forever. forever. Yeah. <laughs> for as long as you want it there. So that was, I thought, a good way to kick off the overall day two and final day of the Black Hat Conference. And I guess for the sake of time uh, for this episode, let's just each pick out like one interesting chat that we saw. Sounds cool. Um, And you want to maybe pick one of yours first and we can dive into it? Cool. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, I'm not going to talk about my favorite talk. My favorite one I'll I'll mention was living off Microsoft Copilot. It actually... If you're someone proof of concept in Copilot, that one will freak you out. I'm not going to talk about that one today because uh, for time's sake, we want to keep this short. So I'll, I'll save that maybe for our recap if we're allowed to do more than just DEF CON stuff. I think so. Yeah, But the, a simple one, an easy one I just want to bring up is a, a big, it's something anyone in the world can can uh, understand and think about. It was called Tracing Origins, Navigating Content Authenticity in a Deep Fake Era. And it was strangely a dude from Adobe. Like we don't think about Adobe people coming to cybersecurity conferences much. So that was interesting. Didn't realize that they weren't just made up entirely of lawyers at this point. (laughs) Although he probably is closer to a lawyer than anything else. Uh Uh-oh. But the the concept was, I think, uh, part of why I wanted to bring it up is you and I have talked about defakes a ton. And it's a problem we don't know how to solve. And one of the, the big worries for me, at least, for deepfakes is misinformation of not just... Deepfakes obviously are getting better and better and will get exponentially better. Not only not being able to identify something that's fake, but once we're not able to identify fake stuff, we're not going to believe real stuff either. And I think on that podcast, you once asked something like, so what's the solution to this? And I I don't think we either really knew, but I did bring up it has to be something like watermarks. At the time of content creation, you would have a watermark. And that's ex- essentially what Pelus Uli talked about. I'm is sorry, who? Pelus, P-E-L-E-U-S, Uli, U-H-L-E-Y. Okay. All right. How would you pronounce it? I don't know. No <laughs> better or worse than you. So he talked about the deep fake problem. By the way, he talked about, he started with things I didn't even, uh, I think we both know that there was that deep fake with Biden's voice, the big deal during uh, the campaign. What I didn't realize is they found that guy. He's been charged with 26 criminal charges, Holy and he's crap. been fined six million dollars. So, crap. making deep fakes of other people is is a big deal, and apparently has some fines behind it. I'm curious, like, I how you can how, what what law how he's is going to be held up? Like, it fun. I, I understand why it should be illegal. Yeah. I just I struggle to understand what the actual law is. That... I, I I don't know the law either. It was huh. he's showing some headlines of why deep fakes were such a big deal, and that was one of them. Some of the concepts he mentioned is this deep fakes are becoming big in politics of all countries india russia all over the world one thing he brought up that i didn't realize is deep fakes aren't always bad there's some politicians like in india they speak like i'm i'm exaggerating but 26 different languages right so there's some indian politicians that commission deep fakes of themselves maybe talking punjabi which they don't speak natively, but if they're trying to get constituents that are native speakers there, they will commission a deep fake of themselves. Oh. So it just adds complexity to, you know, how do you differentiate real video or voice from fake video malicious voice versus fake video that is good versus fake, you know, it, it's just becoming a cluster bad word, which I won't say. Long story short, he got to, There's actually an organization that uh, Adobe and a lot of other companies have put together called the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, C2PA, that was founded in February 2021. Really rolls off the tongue. I know. More acronyms, right? And not even great ones. Uh, Has almost a thousand members, uh, all big companies, which are trying to solve this problem. They're trying to figure out standards and, and ways to basically put some uh, authenticity information, or at least, uh, what did he call it? He's not saying that assertions, putting assertions in image video that says, this video was created at this time by this person on this camera, 
and it's digitally signed. So Interesting. long story short, C2PA is like the, the founding organization that's writing the spec for how you would add metadata to images, audio, and, and other content to try to give it some digitally signed authenticity. Uh, he also talked about a standard they've created, uh, which is CAI, Content Authenticity Initiative. And you, you already know the metadata that's in images. It's, it's building off that similar metadata, but adding a digital signing part of it. So people will have keys. He talked about the, the CAs, the certificate authorities that will be involved. They're going to be different than browser ones because it's for a different uh, reason and, and other things around that. So long story short, the takeaway is there is an organization trying to create a standard and folks like Nikon and Canon are already using some of the, the SDK that CAI is making. And so when their cameras take a picture, they're embedding this content in the image and you can even have your, like a journalist can have a certificate that says, I signed this, this is my picture, this is the original. And if anyone tries to take that image and alter it in some way, create a deep fake of it, it wouldn't be signed right so you'd know it's fake. If the journalist is in another country, wants to send it home and the newspaper wants to make sure this is not someone spoofing the journalist, they have the digital certificate. So it's at least a way to maybe add some not mandatory but possible data to images and audio and, and video so is the proposal like a unique key per individual like maybe yes the journalist would be tied to my camera kind of thing it's a unique key per individual and that individual can use that key in devices okay. in photoshop and in other things but then is also talking about like ai creations like dolly is part of this organization they would agree to put metadata that also identifies this image was created by Dolly and have a signature there, maybe even for the per the user on their site that created the image. So it adds some accountability. Uh, so at the very least, you know, it's not going to be mandatory because for privacy and, and uh, you know, some things for kids, you, you can't force this on everything. Uh, but if, if you do do it, you can at least tell this is the person that said all this detail. Again, the reason he called it assertions, the assertion is I made this image in this program, I made this image at this time at this date. Maybe those are all lies. Like you could lie about that and sign it with your, your certificate still, but at least it would be known that if that ever comes out that you lied, that was your certificate, you're the liar. That's interesting. So like actual repudiation protections as well, yeah. too, where you can prove the origin of something. Yeah. Even if he even showed an later. example where, you know, he made a, a, an original image in Dali and it had it had a flaw in it. It had like three strings instead of two for a hoodie. He made a hacker image. So the Dali had all the attestation and digital signature saying this was made that way. But then he went in Photoshop and edited one of the strings out and it, it had that chain. So you saw, okay, this original was made in Dali, but this is a changed one by someone else in Photoshop. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, yeah. maybe this is a potential solution then. It, it, it's the best I can think of right now, but it is like voluntary. So it will have to be people deciding that if images or videos don't have this, they don't trust it. And it, even then, when you are looking at this, you have to realize the only, th everything in the, the metadata is an assertion. The only thing you can know for sure is that this person's private key signed it. That's interesting. Cause I mean, the, the main, the end goal of this is like, how do you get the everyday citizen to give a crap about this? Like, I, it makes sense where like now a news organization can yeah. say, oh, you know, that was actually blah, blah. I think it will happen though. I mean, if we start to get bombarded with misinformation, the one thing, like a, a normal user's not just gonna go look for this metadata. It has to be the programs we open it will start to show this. Like imagine you open something in Photoshop and it, ought, it has a green check mark versus a red one showing it has this information. But, but it will have to be the point where normal people are so sick of misinformation that they look for it. So who knows if it will catch on. And, and I, if it's only in the metadata, no normal user is going to use it. But I imagine other programs will start to give you, easy, like the, the green lock thing on a secure website. They'll give you something showing that at least the image has this in it maybe. I could see that. Like something displayed on youtube or something because no. i mean it has to be real time is my opinion it can't be a like fact checked after the fact because yeah. like as we've seen from just you know verbal misinformation from certain politicians 
Like, it doesn't matter if you fact check it two days later because their base is already eaten up as truth and they will never see that. And reality. that's why they're working with content. That's why they're working with camera companies. That's why they're working with image generation or video generation companies. And even chipset makers, uh, you know, the chipsets that go in all these equipment too. So we'll see if it takes off. It seems to have some, some momentum. And now we've got to worry about like protecting cryptographic keys and cameras. Are we going to start throwing TPMs I, and everything? Now I was too? going to say, I, I mean, we say you at least know it was signed by someone's private key. You still don't know if it was signed by them because what happens if their private key gets yeah, stolen? What's to stop like, me from stealing someone's camera yeah. and like ripping it out of the firmware then? Although that's why the chip makers are getting involved. You put it in the TPM and it should at least be harder to strip out of the camera or whatever chipset device. So this in. is just all a ruse from big hardware trying to... Uh, so I guess we'll fun. find out. We'll find out. <laughs> Either way, that's really interesting. That is a potential solution to what I thought was a unsolvable It's going, it's going to be a hard problem. It'd be interesting to see if this works. Yeah, cool talk. Um, the one I wanted to go over was actually the very last one I went to today. Um, it was called, Are Your Backups Still Immutable Even If You Can't Access Them? <laughs> um, and it was by Rushnak Shetty and Ryan Kane. If a tree falls in a forest, <laughs> does, it, does anyone actually hear? Yeah. And so it was really interesting. And the whole topic was, it starts with the premise that, you know, ransomware operators, they are trying to go after your backups. Yep. Because most organizations, hopefully, have a good backup and restoration process. And a lot of them are like automated cloud, like Veeam. So they have systems that are pretty standardized that a ransomware author can just kind of go after quickly. Exactly. So if you can disrupt those backups, either make them unrecoverable, uh, you probably can't delete them. And in this case, they showed like ways that you could not delete them. Um, but if you can at least slow down the recovery, you might still incentivize that company to pay the ransom in huh. order to get back online quickly. And so I forgot what company they work for, but this basically started their two penetration testers internally for the company they work for. And this started as a like targeted penetration testing engagement to evaluate the immutability of their own backups that their company were using. Huh. And so they went after the three backup systems that they're using. One of them was a Dell EMC uh, data domain device. Um, another one was an IBM a DS8000 device. And then also cloud backups using AWS's backup service as well too. It was interesting for the Dell one, the EMC one, they had a lower level environment device that they could just go ham on. Uh, the DS8000, though, it was they only had a production one, and so they were a little constrained yeah, in their, uh, what they could play with. Exactly. Um, but they still got some um, wins on that one. And then AWS Backup, they got their own account in their Azure organization to, again, just go ham on and see headed. what they could do. Um, so basically, it walked through the steps they took in their penetration testing engagement to see, could I, as a ransomware operator, uh, make these seemingly immutable backups unusable because uh, most of these tools in fact all three of these and most major backup solutions these days have different features in them um, like compliance requirements um, or like a write once read many protections where basically as soon as you write to storage a bit gets flipped or a fuse gets hit or something and you are now unable to overwrite that at all and there's no way to do that without just completely reformatting the whole device or shipping it back to the manufacturer or whatever I know in AWS's, um, their compliance hold feature, basically you have to sign like a, a, send a legal letter from your lawyer with like a court order or oh, something wow. to turn off some of these features too. That's good. Yeah, so there's a lot of really strong protections where once you write to the data, you can still read it, but you cannot delete it or modify it. And that's the intent. So they were trying to see how can we still break access to this? So starting with the Dell EMC device, it was really interesting. It has a, a really stripped down shell that you can use to access it. Um, similar to like what the Firebox has from WatchGuard where yeah. you can run certain commands. It's not an actual bash shell, yeah. um, but you can still like do management activity on it. It did have uh, at the time something called it the SE mode, the systems engineering mode, mm -hmm. which had a few more commands that you could do, but still not a true bash shell. Um, but Dell does actually have like a... I, a, the ability to open a bash shell on the device it's you have to go through their support you have to set up credentials you have to get a key that only Special works key. for four hours in order to do it and that does open up the actual bash shell but even with that level of access you can't just go in and like delete the files there's other protections in there um so they were going through from the premise of 
Like, let's say we had access to that, you know, the limited shell, what could we do? And there's actually not a whole lot you can do to modify configurations or gain root access on it. But they did find one undocumented configure or one undocumented command in this yeah. limited shell called reg show config, uh -huh. which is basically going into the registry of the device, like the configuration setup for it, and grabbing all of the configuration items out of it. And okay. when they were reviewing that, they found a few configuration items that were effectively cron jobs on there. Huh. And the cron jobs were running as root on the device. Oh, and they love found... those root cron jobs. You can... <laughs> exactly. Um, so they found that through the SE mode, you could also do a reg update command to ah. update some of these settings in there. And basically, they ran the, the reg set command for config cron tab and then a certain cron tab entry and basically set it to, when it executes, open up a reverse shell to a server under their control. So that was their way to gain at least root access to the file system. But they still couldn't delete data. Like, it was still protected with wow. that write once, read many thing. Um, but what they found they could do was go in and... Um, I guess one last little bit of background info. Uh, in this Dell system, there's a bunch of different, like, local user accounts that are responsible for, like managing the data backups on there okay. they're not accounts that like one of us would log into but they're accounts locally that other processes can use to authorize themselves to like manage configurations or manage the backups so what they found though is they can go in and change the passwords for these accounts <laughs> uh in the etsy shadow file like oh, the great. local linux file and then also remove the ldap configuration so that basically the system could no longer manage backups. Users it could wouldn't no authenticate it. and it couldn't do anything it's supposed to do at that exactly. point internally. Yeah. And wow. so basically it bricks the device yeah. and they predicted that like through support with Dell, you they could recover. probably recover. You might have to have someone like come in physically, like um, remount the hard drive and like re-add these credentials. So it's possible to recover, but I would add slow it down a time, lot and that might incentivize an organization to then pay the ransom especially because they used to have 72 hour one week timers so you don't have a long time good news is dell fixed a lot of this uh, they even removed that se mode entirely and in the retests uh, these two individuals they weren't able to find a, a way to replicate that's that good thing then they moved on to the ibm ds 8000 which is like a single piece of hardware with three different services running on it one of them is like the management service. One of them is responsible for uh, the backup management. The other one's responsible for recovery for the backups. Um, this is the one where they only had production access. So they were given some pretty strict guardrails of basically nothing that could impact production on it. So they couldn't ultimately like prove that they could disrupt it like they did with the Dell one, but they still found some interesting things. Um, so for two of those three applications, first off, they are able to log in with default credentials, uh -oh. um, which gave them full administrative access to them. Uh, for the third one, they were prevented from logging in by the UI. Like they had credentials to get in, but the logout button was grayed out huh. in the web page. And uh, as you might suspect, you could go edit the HTML, <laughs> remove the disabled flag, <laughs> and, then, wow. and hit log in, and you gain <laughs> admin access then at that point. Wow. Um, they found that they could um, read arbitrary files off of the machine through a series of exploits, or at least read the first line of arbitrary files off the machine. That does include the Etsy shadow file, so they could get Passwords. the admin password out of there. They also found they could delete arbitrary files as uh -oh. root on the device. Um, but they DOS suspected... DOS capabilities? Or? Exactly. They could most likely block access to yeah, this you device. Couldn't, you probably couldn't override the actual backup, but you might be able to override a system file that would cause nastiness. Exactly. So they found they could enumerate all the files on the file system, and they figured pairing that with this arbitrary file delete, they could find the important system files that let it run, delete it, and it would basically make it unrecoverable again without help from the manufacturer. And the third one was AWS backup. And this one was interesting. It wasn't, they didn't find necessarily an issue with AWS backup itself. It was more of a series of issues within their own organization's implementation of it. Uh -huh. um, so they uh, were given a, their own account in their group organization um, called like POC backup or something. And then they had like simulated backup data going to that, just like the actual production account was using. So that was their target to go after. And they started out with no access to it whatsoever. 
So as a penetration testing engagement, first thing they tried to do was gain any bit of credentials that could like get them into the system or environment or something related, then they could move laterally, elevate, and ultimately gain access on that. So what they ended up finding was internally at their company, there was a Docker repository uh, that was unauthenticated. And so they were able to go in and pull Docker containers out of this repository. And one of those containers had administrative credentials to their internal GitLab uh, source code repository. Um, so GitLab, just like GitHub, have this concept of uh, actions where basically you can run uh, CI, CD automations um, on like containers that get spun up. So like at WatchGuard, we would use them to like build source code and then deploy it to the actual application. Um, so these containers that get spun up though, you can create um, like a pool of ones that are just permanently available and then you can attach permissions to them. So for example, um, the AWS infrastructure team at their organization had a set of these runners as they're called um, that had, there were actually EC2 instances in AWS and they had a IAM role attached to them that gave them sure. some permissions within AWS because for what they're supposed to be used for is building and deploying code to the AWS environment. Yeah, yeah. And so now using this GitHub Actions, um, they were basically able to assume the role of this slightly more privileged, privileged account within AWS um, to give them access into the AWS like organization. Um, they found that uh, from that instance, they were able to assume another role. So AWS, it's like this series of like, it's like an onion of roles <laughs> where you can have a role attached to like a, a server, an EC2 instance. That role might have permissions to assume another role under certain circumstances or under any circumstance. Long story short, these runners could assume a role that had full admin permissions, literally like star dot star. So any wow. access on any resource. And so long story short, from the unauthenticated access to a Docker repository, they're able to get GitLab administrative credentials. That then let them use the GitLab runner to gain access to the infrastructure production account within the AWS organization. They were then able to assume the role, which then gave them access into that POC account, which they then used to just delete the account. <laughs> Well, there you go. That's the yeah. easy way to delete immutable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you're so using you can't AWS. delete the uh, the backups in the AWS backup service, but you can, but you can delete, delete the, the whole account. Bank account. Yeah. yeah. Now, again, this is another one where AWS could probably help you recover, recover that. It. I assume they keep like still there. The, yeah. The but hat. it would slow it down. Yeah. So I thought this was like a really interesting talk, like from the perspective of a penetration tester, like pretending they were a ransomware operator. And like, here's what we would do in our own company's environment to make sure yeah. they could not recover from a ransomware attack. That was kind of cool. And very cool. Terrifying. Because yeah, very terrifying. These are all things that like, even those that last I one, wonder if they just knowing that since they were pen testing themselves, they had a little bit of internal knowledge that might help make lateral movement quicker. But a threat actor sitting on networks for a long time could eventually probably learn all that. Exactly. I mean, none of it's out of the realm of possibility. Like, yeah. it totally makes sense a threat actor would find a unauthenticated Docker repository internally. We, yeah, we've seen privilege escalation in so many ways once you're inside. Exactly. So it's totally in the realm of po You're right, though, like a white box test versus a black box test, which is what, like, from the perspective yeah. of a... I mean, I, I for instance, the Docker, the place that had all the Dockers, did they have knowledge of that before so they might have had an idea yeah. but like like a black park test bad guys would just take a little longer to find this all out yeah so either way i thought that was a really cool talk and like the main takeaway that i had was just because your backups are immutable and like there's actually proven technical controls making it so you can't modify that data doesn't, doesn't mean, mean you can't screwed. just totally screw up the availability of yeah. that backup solution too um, so really interesting and like you like there were so many other interesting talks today that will hopefully kind of yeah, cover at least one ton. or two more on the next one you would have liked the uh, the attack on uh, rpki for bgp oh <laughs> anyways we'll talk about it later that sounds cool uh yeah. but that's it for black hat now i feel like that went way quick it did I don't know if I have the energy for the more fun summer camp, but it is more fun. Maybe I'll get the energy. Well, we didn't have a booth, so I'm chock full of energy right now and <laughs> ready to go how. for DEF CON. <laughs> You're doing so much at the same time. It's, it's Pop Pop Corey, my old man talking. <laughs> it's uh, the 
shots of caffeine running through my blood right now that are That's maybe just helping. keeping me vertical. But <laughs> either way, next up is DEF CON, which is the more technical, hands-on conference. It's just fun. Interesting characters. People let their hair down. You get the uncensored version of talks. Yeah. They're, they're usually fun. I'm really looking forward to that. And we will have a recap for that one uh, early next week for you with our favorite takeaways from DEF CON as well as maybe a couple one or two Hat. more from we'll Black see. Hat. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, thanks for listening. And uh, I guess that's a good place to end. Yep. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, keep that to yourself. I mean, rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, thanks again for listening. Uh, if you have any questions on today's episode or suggestions for future episode topics, reach out to us on Instagram at watch Send the messenger pigeon at this point. Underscore technologies or email us or smoke signals or whatever. But yeah, thanks again for listening and you will hear from us next week. Peace.